Justin, thank you for being with us here. And, and it's, it's an honor to have you here so you can give us a, a quick peek around what you're trying to develop at USL. And uh, what we wanted is to start with you and kind of your journey up until now and, and what you do there at USL. Sure. Well, thanks. Thanks for having me on. And what I'd say at, just to kick it off is it's an exciting time to be in soccer in the United States. Your coverage that that, that you guys do and just the million, millions of fans around the United States that are coming out in record numbers and watching in record numbers, it's, it's just an honor to be able to work in, in the sport that, that we all love and, and care about so much during this exciting growth phase. And so my, myself, again, like, like a lot of our, I'd say most of our league staff, I grew up playing the game. My, my dad was my coach growing up. He, who, you know, he, he had a great playing career, played in the old NASL. So I had a really good coach growing up, which, which definitely helped. And then, you know, kind of culminated in a playing career at, at Duke. So now on the business side, it's equally, and I think more, more exciting for me because we're in a great position now where every day, what I spend a lot of my time on is our expansion clubs and every club that we can open up is 30 plus playing jobs, you know, four or five coaching jobs, 30 to 50 front office jobs, and hundreds typically of construction jobs. More than that, on a, on a go forward basis, it is, you know, millions of dollars in economic impact. So again, it's just a pleasure to work in the sport that we love and, and get to create you know, these billions of dollars of economic impact across the country. Absolutely. And actually, it's, it's a great perspective. Usually here in Europe, what we see is that you have leagues that they pretty much take care of the sporting side. Then <laughs> there's the meteorite sponsorship and kind of the basics. And they kind of, you know, centralize certain rights, distribute some of the money, but the clubs you know, they kind of take care of their business themselves. But it's an interesting perspective what, what you are describing because, you know, you're talking about economic growth and how you empower your clubs to be vectors of that growth in their communities. And I, we'll, we'll touch on that as we go along in the conversation. And for, for the people that is listening here that probably don't have kind of the, the bird's eye view of what is the USL and what it, it comes from, could you give us a bit of that? I mean, it's, it's, it's one of the, let's say, the, the, the longest tenured companies within soccer in the U.S. And now you are actually spearheading a change. I, I just saw the, the documentation and, and, and the whole strategy in, in your position in the brand and everything, which is outstanding. So can you take us to some of that, let's say, fundamentals of where you came from and where you're heading? That's a, it's a great point. So the, the USL has been around for over, you know, 20, 25 years. This current ownership that, that came in with Rob Hoskins and Alec Papadax, my father, we want to set a, a new direction. And that direction was to really take the level of our teams up and to ultimately have two of the top 10 leagues in the world between you know 10 12 years ago when we got it and where our goal is to have two of the top 10 leagues of the world we knew it was going to take a lot of work it was going to take a lot of a lot of capital and it was going to take a lot of great people at our city partner side at our ownership side at our team management and and most importantly our our players and fans and so you know, we, we're, we're just in the early stage of this project. And despite that, we are, we are building stadiums all across the country. We have billions of dollars of stadium anchor developments. 
and what we're most proud of though is is having you know a thousand and and growing plane jobs a high quality plane jobs because for the united states to continue to grow as a soccer powerhouse which i which i firmly believe it will be over the next 10 20 years that starts with having great playing opportunities when i'm i'm 35 so you know not that far out of the youth system and when i was in in my you know 15 16 a lot of you know the the really star players of of my peers they would go to you know, europe because there just wasn't a lot of strong clubs that had a great playing experience and so that that's changing now and you'll see over the next 6 months the continued massive growth of the USL you saw one example last night with the proposal put forward in New Mexico for a 70 million dollar stadium and and that that's where we're going it's going to have a first class fan experience and a absolute electric environment for these ama amazing players that that we have in the USL absolutely congrats on that that's a sign of the you know the trust on the process of, towards the future you know when you have investment from cities and evidently the private sector the owners to actually commit to that it's uh, it's a testament of of the of the value that you'll see there going going down the road that's uh, absolutely amazing and to understand a little bit the situation because you know in the in the now in this within this pandemic that we are living the whole industry sports entertainment and and uh, what not Have, has been severely affected what is the the current state of the business in in general for the USL family the clubs what what you can tell us about that in terms of pre pandemic during the pandemic and what is the outcome coming out of it sure well you know the pandemic was hard for all industries but particularly hard on on live sports and entertainment and USL you know definitely was not an exception to that I think though that we really worked hard. We have we have just an amazing group of owners and the first concern was the the health and safety of our players, coaches and staff and fans. And so we managed through that I think very well. And and now because of a lot of work behind the scene during the pandemic I would just give a lot of credit to our city partners particularly on our expansion side that enables us to accelerate so many deals. And so as I mentioned, you, know, you saw one last night, you've seen announcements in Spokane and in several other markets over the past couple of months and over the the second half of 21, you'll see the result of again just incredible city partners that had so much to deal with in the health and safety of their their residents but they they did see the significant impact that our stadiums can have particularly economic impact for their residents and so they worked with us you know every single day through the pandemic and and you'll see the the fruits of that over the sec second half of of 21 And getting a little bit more deeper into the development of venues you know my I, i'm from the dominican republic although I've, i've been here in europe almost 20 years now but my first soccer memory comes precisely out of the 94 world cup in the us sure. and you know kind of the the let's say the the signature view is that it was a, a soccer tournament played in non-soccer specific stadiums, you know, yeah. big football stadiums or athletic stadiums and so on. So to, to go back and do a little bit kind of a, a where were you? I mean, you, you had soccer, as you explained, you know, in your household from the beginning, but kind of what is, what are the memories for you in, in terms of remembering the 94 World Cup? And what is the expectation from you as an executive of the USL of 26 
and going forward in terms of you know that being a, a potential driver for the development of, of, of your competition and, and, and the club's business? Well, I think the 90, 1994 World Cup, you know, we use that as kind of the, the, the benchmark to kick off the modern, you know, modern professional soccer in the United States on the men's side. And, you know, I you know, had, had fortune to, to go to a couple matches in Orlando. And when you see, when we kick off in, in 2026, the growth of soccer in the United States between those two bookends, it's going to be incredible. What you'll see at the USL level is 65 to 70 amazing clubs that have well-established brands, fan bases, and, and stadiums. And so you mentioned, I think it was a great point that all the 94 took place, you know, in, in uh, uh, largely NFL stadiums. And what you'll see now in 2026 is that around the country, outside of the top 30, you know, markets, fans of soccer can go see high level professional soccer with great fan experience week in and week out in their city. And the clubs represent their city. And that's a big point of differentiation for us is when we look outside of, you know, the top 30 MSAs, all of those markets, there are tremendous soccer fans. Again, New Mexico, just using an example from last night, no one would have said New Mexico is, is a big soccer market, certainly at the 94 World Cup or, or, or even three years ago. What New Mexico has shown and so many other markets around the country is that people are excited about soccer, but they're excited about their community more, more so. And when you bring those two together, that, that, that's magic. And if we can do it in amazing venues, that's affordable for families to go to, it's, it's special. And when you go to those games, you feel the, the energy and the soundtrack of, of, of matches across the USL. It's, it's just, again, it's really humbling to get to, you know, play a part in that growth because those are memories that, that people have for a lifetime and those clubs will be there for a lifetime. And, and again, we're, we're excited to play a part in that. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and thinking about the, the World Cup in 26, so one thing that you see around uh, big tournaments, either World Cups or Euros around Europe, is that there's a whole, let's say, logistics e economy in terms of when those big tournaments come to a certain city, because evidently you probably will have the big matches in the bigger venues, but yep. those teams need to have, you know, home bases for the length of the tournament, right? So when you have soccer specific venues that are in great communities that are, that are embracing soccer, you will see a lot of those big national teams actually trying to pick those that are logistically convenient for, you know, for their, for their calendar in the, in the tournament, yeah. but that will definitely land in, in, in most of those, uh, those venues and communities that, that, that you run at the USL. So that's also something interesting and, you know, in terms of analyzing potential value there. So what, one, of, one of the things that, I, that also I wanted to, to give our, our audience, which is basically comprised of peers of our industry, executives and people that, that, that work in the industry, is to, to position in, in the soccer map in the U.S., the USL, sure. to, to give them a little bit of a structure in terms of what is the depth of the company in terms of the different leagues and divisions that, that you run. And also in terms of your perspective, in terms of how everything stacks up within the rest of the soccer ecosystem, namely the, MS, the MLS or, or NWSL. Well, all the MLS, NWSL are, you know, personal friends of ours. And we're all trying to do the same thing. And that's grow the game of soccer in the United States. 
and we give a lot of credit and, and a tremendous amount of respect to the MLS and NWSL for, for growing the game. And so what we want to do and what our strategy has been is to be significantly more vertically integrated. So we have our, the championship league one, uh, league two, which is primarily comprised of the top collegiate players during the summer. And we have, you know, 90, 90 plus of those clubs, which are going into to next year. And then we have the USL Academy, which is, which is going to grow significantly every year because of the growth of our professional and league two properties. And then we have super Wiley, which we have, you know, 10, 10, 12,000 players uh, across the country. So exciting for us. Oh, you know, in the past uh, month or so we've uh, announced the uh, USLW league and the women's side of soccer is uh, extremely important for us. We want to, play a, a part uh, in that growth. And, and I think you'll see, you know, more involvement for the USL at the W League level, at the academy level, and, and others to, to help grow the women's game like we have done on the men's side. When you look at the, the league office, and this was and, this was and is a big uh, – reason that we've been able to grow is because the league has made a uh, tremendous investment in our in our league office i have the privilege of working with 80 and, and growing amazing sports executives and they are working every day to to help grow grow the league and like the mls like the nba like the NFL and, and other top leagues around the United States and the world, soccer is, is a business. It has to be run like a business and you have to have uh, talent that helps guide it. So what we've done, the league side is really invest in that. And just as an example, and for your listeners, uh, I think we have six or seven open positions right now in a new department that we created for our expansion strategy team that is going to work exclusively with clubs that between, you know, them signing the franchise agreement and opening, which could be two to four years, we're going to have a team of seven or eight individuals at the start and, and perhaps that'll grow. That'll just work with them on ticket sales strategy, sponsorship, merchandise, website app, digital strategies, marketing, et cetera. And so we want to optimize our team's business because when the teams are successful off the field, that, that means that we can, you know, be successful on the field. And so we put a lot of work into that. And, and so the league takes a big role in that An additional, you know, point that might be of interest to your audience is with the rapid growth USL, we've taken another kind of different approach. And that is for our stadium side. And what I spend a lot of time on with my chief real estate officer hat is to work with city partners across the country. So we're active in over 35 markets for the past four plus years and looking at how do we structure our stadium deals and so some are quick, some are long. Stadiums inherently are complicated projects. And a lot of our projects are entertainment districts, which can you know, go up to $550 million projects. And so we've been working in those markets, structuring the deals and going through the entitlements and all sorts of other you know, factors to put these types of developments together and and you're going to start to see really the the fruits of that come on over the next six months when we're going to announce some amazing developments and which will lead to amazing clubs and so it's again it's just super exciting and uh, 
you know, a lot, lot to come in second half of 21. Yeah, uh, this is something that when we were doing the prep for, for this uh, conversation that actually kind of intrigued me, but excited me in terms of seeing how from the league you are, let's say, taking decisive action into actually building or developing the business around it. So then you can have a club there that is successful. It, it's 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 different like what you see in other in other places even in other american leagues in which you have you know a, a finite number of franchises and you know there's investor interest then there's a process and then there's a matter of relocation or not and and you know that has yep. another layer of, of complications but for you is actually how to empower those community based projects to make it to make soccer one of the central protagonists of that and actually that's how you see a, a well balanced multi purpose multi let's say you know a wider entertainment of opportunity for an investor to come in and invest into into the league right you kind of describe it right now in terms of you are actually allocating resources to be able to 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 develop that and 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 support that Why, why do you do that, that approach instead of the, let's say, traditional way of running a league, which is we have the power to expand or not, or relocate or not. Let's see the highest bid for our franchises. So when we, we looked at the landscape, you know, 10, 10, 12 years ago, what we saw was a country with, you know, 350 million people, again, roughly the equivalent size of, of Europe with, you know, at that time, essentially, you know, only a handful of cities that had professional soccer, again, compared to Europe with, you know, hundreds of teams across, across, you know, do, several dozen uh, leagues. And so we saw an opportunity and, but we knew that to do it right, we had to have the right fan experience. And so we really set out a mission to, and we had some advantages, we thought. Unlike an NFL stadium or a Major League Baseball stadium, because of their sheer size, we, we, we have a smaller footprint. And so we knew that if, again, it still is very difficult, but if we could go into downtown urban settings in many markets, we thought, and put together a stadium project that was great for the community. We could leverage transportation, parking, and other elements, but also have transformative developments that would have a significant economic impact on our cities. And so we really set out to do just that. And as The result of that, it also creates some better economics, uh, but it also, again, there's a, a lot of different financing concepts, but one, you know, just from a high level is called tax increment finance, TIF. And so essentially the concept is pretty simple where you have property that exists today that has nothing on it, that essentially generates no tax dollars. And if we, We're able to bring in, you know, a lot of private capital to create a large scale development that would start generating tax dollars. You know, that that spread, some portion of that spread could go to help pay for stadiums. And so it's really a win win, a uh, true private public partnership and one that our city partners have been super excited about because they've seen that especially now post COVID employee and talent can live anywhere. And so having a professional soccer team in their city was a way to attract and retain talent and really provide an amenity that a lot of people are looking for. And so again, it's, it's been, it, it's a lot of work, especially across 35 markets, but we've just had the good fortune of working with, incredible city partners that have really dedicated so much time 
uh, in effort to bringing these uh, projects to fruition. And again, the result of that is a great fan experience uh, for fans and an incredible atmosphere for, for our amazing players. And actually, I, I have a question in terms of, you know, what is your institutional relationship with your peers across Europe, for example? Because what you are describing is actually the reality of the majority of, of uh, the football clubs across Europe. I mean, you have the, you know, the key cities, the Barcelona, the Madrid, the, these big mammoth cities with, with clubs and, and, and stadiums. But the reality of, of, of soccer in, in Europe is actually, we are talking about a lot of mid-sized cities that, that host uh, a, a professional club. Evidently, the, the historical nature of some of those clubs is it's, it's not as the same as you know, building a franchise. But the reality is that in terms of the business fundamentals and actually building or redeveloping the, redeveloping the stadium could be something that, you know, there are learnings in, in the way you are approaching this. And, and actually, that's, that's where this, this question prompted about, you know, what type of interest you are getting from people here in Europe on, to understand what and how you are doing it and, and what is the relationship on the institutional level with other leagues across the continent. It's a great question and a timely question because the, the short answer to your question is we're getting a significant amount of interest from European investors and in particular large European clubs in, in the USL. And I think there's a couple of reasons for that. First is, you know, a, a 10 year track record in the asset appreciation of our, of our clubs. I think we really have shown a, a strong track record for investors in, in, in our properties. Second, as you mentioned, I think we have different sizes of cities, but when you look at an apple to apple comparison versus many clubs in Europe, our populations, they're, they're mid-sized cities in the United States, which would be very large sized cities in, in Europe in many cases, um, especially on a per team basis, where we have large and growing populations we have very strong household income and we have extremely, again, comparatively to a lot of cities in, in Europe, extremely strong corporate bases. So what our strategy has been is to build great venues, really engage the, the corporate partners within our, with our communities that really care about their communities. And, and the result has been building great clubs and fan bases. And so that that's just super exciting. When you look at our the priority, one major priority over the next five years, as indicated by the hiring of our first sporting director, Mark Cartwright, who in, in our view is, you know, one of the, uh, the leading, you know, f football voices in, in Europe is to build out our academy because the United States produces some of the best athletes in the world. Up until now, we just have had a structural problem in developing them. I really believe that that's changing and you'll see world-class talent coming out of our academies. And so that is one of the main draws for, as you mentioned, a lot of European clubs that we're having uh, conversations with. As soon as flights open up, I have to, I have to get over to to London to to meet with a lot of them because they they are just so bullish on now what the growth potential is for the U.S. player and it's it, it's exciting and so just to final finish up that point when we look at 2026 I think that'll be the first time where you really see this new generation of player who have come really through the the new academy system fully here in the United States. So we have a couple of years of, of that talent going through. And um, I'm a little, little, little biased, but I, I really believe that the United States is going to produce world-class talent. And that is going to have a 
a dramatic impact on the results in the World Cup. And I think you'll see that as a starting point in full effect in the 2026 World Cup. Yeah, actually, I had a within this series about the, the U.S. perspective into soccer business. With a, we had a conversation also with Brad Friedel, which is one of the the, the former U, U.S. national team members, and and he pretty much developed his whole career in Europe. And he, you know, it, it was kind of a unicorn. Then you have you know the the southern talent that went abroad. But because of that disconnection from the college game towards the pro game in the U.S., it's, it's where you saw that disruption in terms of talent development. Now what you're seeing is that, you know, you have a few players that, you know, are Champions League winners or are playing for FC Barcelona or big clubs. And I think that investing into the academy system and actually be able to hit a stride in producing world-class talent it is the you know the the basic produce that makes the business go around. You, know, you need to have talent to to be able to to develop that, and that's something that that it's interesting going forward. And I bet that most of the the European clubs are looking at that. And actually, you know, you'll get a lot of proposals in terms of let's do some partnership and let's open funnels to bring that talent and continue their development here. Because the same that happened to basketball with China or, you know, even, even football in Europe with China, I, I do see that from the, from the market size and, 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 and the interesting trades of the U.S. as a market, also working from that side. If you have a top American talent in your team here in Europe, in terms of commercialization and, and, and all the possibilities that the, that kind of being been exposed to the US as a market can bring you is a lot of a lot of potential upside in terms of business so that's that's a, certainly one clever move for your internationalization absolutely you know Brad was one of the pioneers and we are going to produce a lot more Brad Friedels that that's for sure and you know there's in if you look backwards a lot of players, you know, despite the structural problems here in the United States, they were able to, you know, be world-class players like Brad because they went to Europe. What we believe is that we are going to, you know, really foster that development by having world-class coaches at our USL clubs, having in that talent, coaching talent flowing all the way down to our academy system. And again, importantly, when you're 15, 16, 17, you have the opportunity to not only train with professionals, but also if, if you're good enough, play in front of, you know, 5, 10, 15,000 people every night and in, in beautiful downtown venues. That's exciting. That, that really helps the development of players. And I, again, the results will speak for themselves. Watch out for the USL academies over the next five years. It's just, I can't wait. We're going to have world-class players. And again, it'll, for the first time, really see the full effect of that in 2026. Absolutely. And to kind of wrap up this conversation, I, I want your take also in, into how you see governance within the USL. I mean, you have, if I'm not mistaken, also enacted promotion relegation across the, the, the two pro levels that you have. And how do you see that evidently differing to the traditional American sports model, which is, you know, based on, on a franchise basis, no, no promotion or relegation. And, and what is the angle in terms of implementing that within the USL, which is more European per se, let's say. Well, Promotion relegation is definitely an exciting concept. And so what we've been working on to try to work towards the possibility of that is to make sure that we have 30 to 35 top quality clubs across championship and league one. And so in order to have promotion relegation, you need two leagues that, that have 
great clubs, fan bases, and unit economics that that are that that make it even a possibility to do that. So that's why we've been working so hard on our with our real estate team to to deliver 35 stadiums over the next three years, four years. And we are well on our way to doing that. And we feel very confident about hitting that. That will put us in a position where, again, we'll, we'll have a conversation with our owners. What we talked about at the meetings last week in San Antonio was that our strategy group but now was going to really kick off the study around promotion relegation. There's a lot of logistics, economics, other other areas that we have to figure out, but we're going to study it. And running parallel to that, again, is our club expansion pipeline and stadium developments that will that will make it a possibility. So we are we're we're definitely on track on the real estate side. We're going to prepare a, a very thorough study for our owners who will ultimately decide whether we, you know, fully implement uh, promotion relegation. What's also exciting, again, uh, a European concept that hasn't really been in full effect here is regional rivalries. And so, again, that's in England and, you know, pretty much every uh, country throughout Europe. One major difference between those countries and the United States is just the a huge geographic area of the United States. And so between championship and league one, we're going to have some absolutely amazing derbies. And we're really looking to see how in the meantime, between now and, you know, if we do promotion relegation, how we can start fostering those, those derbies, because that's a special part of sports. I think that's a big part of what makes European soccer so exciting. And we're going to have the ability to do that here in the United States. So, you know, stay tuned. Excellent. No, I definitely, and in closing, I really think that this strategy that you're taking, it's, it's, uh, it's something that, that we in Europe that work in this industry need to, need to see closely and in detail. Because just talking about promotion and relegation, the fear of relegation comes out of economic fear, not nothing else. And actually, if you don't have the basis or you don't have a strong economic project around it, that's when relegation can become a problem. If you take that out of the equation because you have stability in the economic side, you can continue to have you know, a packed uh, a stadium and, and your development around it, it's just sports and it's that's the fun part in actually fighting for coming up or, or or not being relegated without fear of you know economic hardship for some of the clubs and that's something that some leagues in europe the premier league is probably the leader in that the spanish league as well in providing financial control and and economic stability to clubs especially the ones that relegate that that allows them to continue and continue to compete the next up i think that you know you have that advantage that you are seeing what is happening in the world and you're building a, a model that pretty much can be an almost perfect model because you're taking the learnings of what's happening thanks. around it so that's something that is highly commendable thank you so much I totally agree again we really pride ourselves on really studying issues we have a great strategy group that thinks about all those complicating factors. Again, we love the concept, but there are a lot of complicating factors. Most importantly, though, what's in, to have promotion relegation, you need, whether at the top level or the level underneath, you need great clubs, great stadiums with strong fan bases. Because without that, you know, there's, you know, you can't really have promotion relegation. We're on track for that. We have a lot of exciting new clubs at both the championship and league one that are, that'll be announced over the next six months. And it, it's going to be fun. Again, just so fortunate to get to work in soccer during this inflection point that we're having right now, as we lead up to the 26 world cup. 
And for soccer fans in the United States, there's going to be no better time uh, than, than now. So thank, thank you again for having me on. Thank you, Justin. And definitely we'll catch up in the next few months to see how everything is unfolding. We'll have a lot of news for you. <laughs> Absolutely. Great. Thank you very much. Stay safe and, and continue the great work. Thank you. This episode is brought to you, as always, by The Connect. The Connect is Alayda Luis Baez. Follow The Intersection Podcast in your favorite podcasting platform. Leave us a review and share it with a friend. This will really help us be found by more of you interested in the topics of sports marketing and deal making. Until the next one.